Good morning and welcome to worship here at St Mary's Church in Stonehouse. Thanks for joining us online. The intimations for this week are that the Sunday School meets every Sunday at 11am. We're meeting using an app called Zoom. So if you want to join in with the Sunday School, please email stninianssss, all one word, at gmail.com. Or if you contact me, I'll let you know how to do that. Last week, there was a call to prayer at 7pm on Sunday evenings to light a candle and to join together in a prayer. The, the same call has been made for this week and actually for the foreseeable future. So please join us at 7pm tonight. Light a candle, place it in your window and join together in the prayer that's on the website and also on the Facebook page. Morning Prayers is at 9.15 on Tuesday and Thursday on Zoom. We're using Zoom as a platform for lots of things because you can join by telephone, so you don't have to be online. So if somebody would like to join us, then please do get in touch with me. Your information should be on the screen and below uh, at the moment. If it's not, um, please do get in touch. We're going to also have a Bible study on Thursday evening at 7.30 and again, we'll use Zoom, so you can either follow the link, use the app on your phone, a tablet, or go on to a laptop or computer. Um, but you can also dial in uh, by telephone. There's a phone number, you just phone the phone number, put in a code, and that's you, and it works great. We're going to have a family quiz on Sunday, also using, uh, sorry, Friday night, also using Zoom. Uh, that's Friday the 3rd at 7 p.m. So a family quiz, you can all join in. We can get up to, I think, 100 people or so on Zoom at the same time, so that should be good fun. Information about all of these things is on the church Facebook page. Um, you don't have to be on Facebook to be able to see the Facebook page, so if you want to go on to that, you can, uh, without having to join up to Facebook. And it's also on the church website. Um, we try to put everything on there, as well as the video for worship and the audio um, every week. So you can go to the church website, which is Saint, that's ST, dash ninians dash stonehouse.org.uk Let's join together in worship. Breath of God, come to these dirty earth-bound bones. Free us from our prisons of fear, all that holds us in captivity. Release our hearts by the power of your forgiveness. Breath of God, come to these dusty earth-bound bones. Touch them and reshape them. Tenderly restore them with a living hope. Transform them in your ever-constant love. Breath of God, come, inspire our worship this morning. Let's join in a prayer of adoration and confession. God of life in all its eternal forms. You breathe life into our human frames. You bring life to our fragile bodies. Creator God, merciful and kind, you care for our simple flesh and blood. You engage with our humble being. We travel through the cycle of life, birth to death. But how much do we really live it? You've given us a universe at which we can marvel. A place and a time about which we can inquire and learn. You've blessed us with people who love us. People who take care of us. And whom we take care of and love in return. You're with us in the joy and pain of birth and death, comforting us when we need it the most. So we're sorry that we don't always acknowledge your presence in those moments and that we don't always accept your comfort. We're sorry for those times when we've failed you, when we have been at fault in some way. Restore us to a full life, a life in relationship, a life in engagement with you and the whole of your creation. Lead us forward. Guide us in the way of Jesus. Give us strength and energy to follow you wherever you lead us. Hear us as we join in Jesus' words in a new way for a new time, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We read from Ezekiel at chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. 
The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me around them. There were very many lying there in the valley and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sin you on you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there was sinew on them and flesh was covered them and skin had come upon them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they might live. I prophesied as he had commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are cut off completely. Therefore I prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open up your graves, I'm going to bring you up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and bring you up out of your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. We read from John chapter 11, verses 1, all the way through to 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Martha and her sister Mary. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it's for God's glory, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after hearing that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews there were just now trying to stone you, and you want to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, A friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was merely referring to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad that you were not there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go also with him, so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, and, and Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she said to him, I know he will rise again on the day of resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Lord, 
I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. And when she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him and knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in his spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man not have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench. It's been four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound with strips of cloth and his face was wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Amen. These two passages, long as they may be, are two of my favourites. But given the situation we find ourselves in, I spent the first half of this week considering if perhaps I should talk about something else. But because today, at least at first glance, the valley of dry bones and the death of Lazarus are rather pretty bleak and depressing stories. Ezekiel is one of the Old Testament prophets during the time when the people of Israel had been defeated and taken into exile in Babylon. They were far from home, cut off from all that they knew and all that they had taken for granted. We read in the Psalms and of course the songs of Boney M that they sat by the rivers of Babylon and they wept. They cry out to God because they just don't understand what has happened. They don't get how God could have abandoned them like this. And I'm sure that many of us know how they felt. Grief and loss, sadly, are not strangers to any of us. And they come in many forms. The loss of a loved one. The loss of a job. The loss of our way of life. Much of what we feel in these strange days is actually grief. That knot in your stomach, that wave of anxiety, it's grief. A sense of loss and fear of what comes next. The people stuck far from home in exile said that they felt like they were dead in their bones to the very core of their being. They didn't know who they were anymore or how they were supposed to be or where God was in all of this. Their story is not so far removed from the story of Martha and Mary when their brother Lazarus dies. Their grief is full of confusion. Where is Jesus? We sent for him. How could this be happening? Why, why didn't he come here and save our brother Lazarus? And in many ways, Jesus' explanation isn't that helpful. While his friend is dying, Jesus is deliberately waiting. He stays away until he's absolutely sure that Lazarus has died. It's hard not to feel the harshness of that. Mary and Martha are his friends. They're as close to him as anyone. He stayed in their house. It was Mary who anointed his feet with perfume and wiped it with her hair. These sisters know who Jesus is and they believe in him. But Jesus is absent. He's missing. He's not there when they needed him the most. 
the sisters are distraught, but even in their grief there is hope. Martha says when Jesus finally comes, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will ask you, give you whatever you ask of him. Even now. I'm not sure there's a greater statement of faith in all the Bible than that. Even now. Lazarus has been dead for four days. But Martha thinks even now, Jesus could do something about it. But Martha, even with all her, her faith can't imagine what is beyond what she already knows. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha replies, well, yes, I know that he will. On the last day, in the day of resurrection, when we will all rise again. Because that's what they believed. On the last day, on the day of resurrection, when God has completed everything, all would be raised to new life in God. But what Jesus says next isn't even on her radar. She knows that he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, but even she's not expecting what he's going to say. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I am I am is the name of God. God is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus is saying, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. It's an astonishing claim. But it's where John's gospel has been leading us from the very beginning. The woman at the well knew it. The man born blind saw it. And now everybody can witness it for themselves. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. But first, first they will see something else. Something I think is just as necessary, something important, certainly for my faith and perhaps for yours. Jesus wept. Even though he knows what's about to happen, even though he is sure that everything will be okay, even though he is God, Jesus wept. Jesus is deeply, deeply moved by the suffering of his friends and the grief of those gathered to support them. And his reaction is so very human. Jesus wept. And the people are surprised and some of them are a bit cynical. What's he crying for? If he'd been here earlier, none of this would have happened. But of course, that's not how the story ends. Even in the midst of their grief, hope remains. Jesus is taken to the tomb and tells them to roll the stone away. And they're horrified. It's been four days, we can't open it. Life is well and truly gone. But Jesus is insistent, open it. And he shouts, Lazarus, come out. And to everyone's astonishment, he does. Lazarus is still tied up, tied up with strips of cloth and he walks out of the tomb with the, the shroud still on his face. I'm not sure we can ever really comprehend what that moment was like for the people who witnessed it. The joy, the astonishment, the disbelief and the fear. Lazarus was dead and now he isn't. This is the last sign of John's gospel, the clearest indication yet of who Jesus really is. Only God has the power to bring life where there was none. But that's not all that this is about. Just like Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones in the valley being covered with sinew and muscle and flesh, it's finally the breath of God, God's own spirit that brings life. And so it is with Lazarus. And so it is with us. This is a story about God's spirit in our lives. In John's Gospel, Jesus is from the very beginning the one who is the opposite to death. The word who brought life. The life that Jesus gives Lazarus is a here and now kind of life. Not a sometime in the future kind. That's what we are offered just as the people in exile were offered just as Lazarus was offered. New life. A different way of being. A life full of God, a life lived in God. 
For many of us, we feel cut off, separated from the people that we love and dislocated from the life that we used to live. We can't even come here to this church to worship. And yet these stories present in the Bible give us an incredible vision of hope and new life, even in the darkest of times. A vision of God's Spirit reanimating a people and reanimating us in answer to their lament and to ours, their cries and ours, their pain and anguish and ours. We're given a vision of the power of God to reach even those who feel like they're dead to their bones, to the very core of their being. We are not and never will be beyond God's reach. Paul tells us as much. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. A challenge now in these darkest days that we find ourselves in, perhaps that might seem like our own kind of exile, is to live out that good news. To tend a relationship with God through prayer, and to bring that gift of life to others whenever we can. To care for one another. To live as those who have faith. To live as those who have life. To live as those who have hope. We are commanded to love one another. To reach out and to bring God's love to all. So let's rise to that challenge in these strangest of times. Because God is here with us always and his spirit is within us always. Amen. Let's join in a prayer for others and for ourselves. Loving God, we give you thanks for life, for all the people who bring joy to our lives and for the people who make us angry and for the people we disagree with and for all the people who love us. Life is a wonderful mystery, given as a gift to us by our Saviour. Death is also a strange mystery, given to us as a gift, which leads us into the next phase of eternal life. Facing death, our own or another's, is a difficult and sometimes hard thing. Sometimes we would avoid it if we could. Grief consumes us at times, makes it difficult to continue to live life to the full. So hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who are facing their own death today. For those people who are coming to terms with illness or facing long and difficult treatments or investigations. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within them. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who are already grieving, grieving the loss of a loved one. For those people caught up in the anger and despair that loss can bring. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who care for those at the end of life, in hospitals and hospices and care homes. For doctors and nurses, for healthcare assistants, for porters and clerks and cleaners. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who care for people in their homes, for the staff who travel to their patients and provide a way for people to be at home. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who live in places where there is no health service, where health care is limited and end-of-life care is non-existent. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who are forced to provide care themselves, for their loved ones, for their families, who struggle to cope in their own who feel they have a lack of experience or understanding, who are overwhelmed by the task that faces them. 
Lord, may they know the, your presence around them and within. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer this day. Give us patience to await your answer and strength to be that answer when you ask it of us. For we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Saviour, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to finish our worship today by reading the psalm for today. It's Psalm 130, and this version is called Psalm 130 Redux. It's by Carla Grosch Miller. Fear gnaws at my belly. Despair creeps into my heart. I stretch my neck to the sky and let the anguish escape from my throat. Hear me. O oh God, merciful and just, any scale will find us wanting. We can stand before you without regret, without the shame that bows the head. I wait. My hands are empty now. I cannot save myself. I wait. My soul waits. I dare to hope. Eyes fixed on the horizon. Breath slow and even. I wait. For I know you are. Love is alive. The greening stirs in the dark loam and will burst into light soon. So may the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and those whom we love this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>